Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, as Pierre said, hello. It's on autopilot. Uh, I did talk about closure in 2007, so nine years ago, uh, I came to Lisbon NYC, which is tiny, and uh, gave the first talk I ever gave to anybody anywhere about closure. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, so today I'm here to talk about closure spec, and I just wanted to see, uh, try to get a measure of like who came today. How many people saw my talk at Closure NYC? Only a couple. Okay. Well, hopefully it's not too redundant for you. Uh, how many people know Closure? How many people would call themselves Closure programmers? How many people don't know Closure at all? Oh, not, not too many. Okay. So I'll go relatively quickly through the slides for I don't know closure yet. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. How about one, two, three, four now? Better? Now it's pointing at me. More volume is not under my control. Check, one, two, three. Hello. All right, we're whistling. All right. So uh, here to talk about closure spec. Uh, and it's an introduction, so I'm just going to talk about some aspects of it, but not really take you through, here's how you do this and here's how you do that. So we're talking about uh, what it is, why it is, uh, what the key ideas are inside it, and I'd like to focus on that mostly. A little bit about some other features and then a little bit more about how to take advantage of it uh, if you want to try to use it. So the first thing to know about closure spec, and it's an important characteristic of Lisps in general, is that you usually extend them by making libraries. And closure spec is just a library. Uh, we are adding a few things into closure to allow it to integrate with spec, um, but we haven't changed the language in order to you know, make spec work. Um, and it's a library that allows you to define and then take advantage of, in many different ways, uh, predicative specs. Um, and integration points are relatively small. So we built a little bit of code inside Closure itself to allow macro expansion to talk to specs. And we built a little bit more support so that the documentation uh, string uh, system will look to specs and uh, enhance the doc strings with specs. Uh, but overall, spec is a set of small tools. It's not like a giant you know, monolithic thing. Yeah, that's getting ringy. So why do we want, hello, why do we want spec? Uh, fundamentally, we want spec so we can write more robust programs. And Clojure has always been about writing robust programs. Uh, its emphasis on immutability and functional programming is about making programs that do what you expect them to do. Um, but it ends up that there are challenges to doing that in any dynamic language that has dynamic typing in that uh, it's on you as the developer to communicate about how things work because there isn't a type system, there isn't sort of a standard recipe for here's how we're gonna communicate about what the arguments are, what the expectations are, functions and uh, whatnot. So it's about talking to each other, here's how this works, um, but it's also about talking between programs uh, between parts of programs so that they can both produce data that's conformant to the expectations of the other end and validate uh, that what they've been handed uh, complies with expectations. Um, some of the things that it's responding to are, you know, the community wanted to say, oh, we want a better way to get errors from macros. Uh, and as I'll talk about in a second, uh, it ends up that that problem isn't a different problem than specifying how data structures should be assembled. If you have error reporting and validation for data structures, you have error reporting and validation for macros. Um, as well as enabling better testing <clears throat> and doing all of this while retaining flexibility in programming. I think uh, many times people uh, presume that the reason why programmers prefer dynamically typed languages is because they're lazy and they don't feel like writing all the types out. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that happens in some languages, uh, but I think the real reason why you would stay in a dynamic language is because you want flexibility. 
as you build larger systems, uh, you realize that so much uh, happens at runtime, and so many things happen over wires, and sort of this presumption in many languages that you know, the type system is going to like solve every problem is just not practical. Um, you know, you know there's the famous adage about you know every large C program has a little crappy list implementation inside it. Uh, <laughs> that's not my adage. That's an old one, but. Uh, but it does, and you know, I used to write crappy lisps inside C++ programs. Uh, and after you've done that for a while, you realize I'm doing this because I don't have sufficient flexibility. My systems are large. I need them to be malleable. I can't afford to, you know, change the whole world whenever some small thing changes. So when you get to the dynamic edges of those programs, you end up doing this stuff. In Clojure, we do it this way all the time. But there are still edges to our programs, and if you do something like in the language that's just about the language, well, you, you run up against the wire and then it stops helping you. Uh, so this sort of connects us, and I'll go through this pretty quickly because it seems like everybody's at least touched Clojure and half of you would call yourselves Clojure programmers. So, But why do we use Clojure? I mean, there's a bunch of choices. There are a lot of dynamic languages. Uh, I think there are you know two fundamental reasons, and this is really abstracting out a lot. One is Clojure has data orientation. A lot of people would not necessarily choose Clojure for this, but they get inside Clojure and they're like, whoa, I mean, everybody's doing everything with maps, <laughs> like everywhere, all the time. Uh, what's, what's going on? And it's something, you know, it's initially a hurdle, then it becomes confusing, eventually it becomes enabling, and finally it's like, of course, this is the way we should be doing this. Um, the other is simplicity, and I think that's a, that's a covering thing for all kinds of stuff, including immutability and functional programming, right? Functional programming is about simplicity. It's about saying, this, the inside of this function is not connected to anything else but itself. You, know, you look at it, and it stands alone. It's not entangled. So functional programming is inherently simple, and immutable data is inherently simple. Uh, but what matters is not just what you know, is possible, but what's idiomatic and practical. And Clojure tries to make these two things that way. Uh, I think, again, in programming, we get sort of highfalutin about our programming languages and programming itself, and you know, it's all about us. And uh, it's really not. <laughs> you know, we used to call programming data processing, and then you know, we were too cool to do that anymore. But th this is what we do. Right? This, how many people do data processing? Do any of these things I just listed? Yeah, I mean, that's what we do. Right? We can call it whatever we want. I'm a software developer. I'm an engineer. You know. Uh, but almost every program is going to take some data in, transform it in some way, stick it somewhere, try to find it again later, manage its life cycle, and send some subset of it to somebody else at some point. Um, and I think being honest about this essential characteristic of programming is something that Clojure does. Uh, and when you talk about data, then you really want to say, well, what is that? Is it a class? Is is you know is data classes? And you know, I would say definitely not. You know, if you go and you look at a form that somebody fills in at a medical center or something like that, there's no classes, there's no Javaisms, there's no languageisms at all. Right? If we if we impose them, we're superimposing them. Um, but there are sort of fundamentals to data, right? There's the idea that things are sequential, that one thing came after another thing. And there's an idea that things are associative. You know, this person's address is that, you know, the mapping from this thing to that thing. Uh, and, and actually, there aren't a lot of others. Um, there are sets which have logical characteristics. And a lot of the rest of data structures is about performance characteristics, but not about sort of the essentials of it. So information has a certain set of primitive properties. And Clojure tries to tap into these and supplies data structures for those. Um, so by not conflating the, the, the processing we're trying to do uh, with the information, we end up with very simple informational classes. Um, if you don't do that, I think you end up with a big misfit when you reach the wire. And you have things like ORMs and all kinds of mismatches. and you know, you can replace the O and the R or whatever you want. The M is always there, and the reason why languages have M's um, is because they just don't have a way to talk about data that's direct and simple and unadorned. And so every time they hit a wire, there's going to be a loss of 
uh, precision compared to the language view of the thing. And every time you, something comes over the wire, they're going to have to superimpose something. Um, so closure embraces data. You know, everybody knows about the data literals. How many people are common list programmers or scheme programmers? Like how many people are common list or scheme programmers that are horrified by closures, things that aren't parentheses? All right, no longer. Still one. No longer. Early on, there were there were many more hands. So this data literals, and that's the thing that a list or scheme programmer would be like, whoa, what'd you do there? You know. Uh, but you know, I like common lisp a lot, and and you know, I don't believe in like I want to just see this in a different, you know, prettier way. Those data structures are first class, as first class to closure as lists are to lisp, and uh, and that was important to me, and also. Um, the idea of conj working on maps, you know, that, that is, that's a, that's a fundamental Lisp idea, cons. Uh, it's just not only about consoles, it's a bigger idea that was, had a certain implementation in common Lisp, but I think was a bigger idea that they had. So closure values that stuff. Um, but by having this set of data literals in this very small, actually, set of data structures, uh, we can have this giant library of functions that manipulate these few data structures. And that's important, and that means that in practice what happens is, at least for the informational part of your program, so programs aren't just information, they, they do all the stuff I said before, but a lot of times there are parts of your program that are like little machines, or like conveyor belts. Um, you do other stuff with that, but in general, when you have information to represent a closure program, you use data. And then a big advantage in closure of having data is that we have this language independent representation. In Eden, it just goes over wires. The reader is a built-in thing. Uh, we now have transit also as a binary high performance thing that reaches the browser really well. Um, both of which take all the data structures of closure and move them around uh, without you having to think about it. Um, and, and it's straightforward because unlike say Java serialization, there's no extra language gook there. It's just the pure informational part. For instance, there aren't object trees and reference cycles and things like that. So we end up using data for everything, right? We represent our programs as data structures. We use data for syntactic extension. The macro system of closure are functions that take code as a data structure and return a different data structure for evaluation. And that's just a data-to-data -data transformation, which is why error reporting for macros turns into this problem because that's all that macros do. Uh, we obviously use data for communication over wires, but you know, we use it everywhere. You know, if you want to have a config file in Clojure, do you use XML? No. You know, you use you use Eden and uh, uh, a lot of libraries support representing markup languages and HTML as closure data um, and so on and so forth schemas, transactions, query languages, type annotations, DSLs, we do this everywhere. And so this is what Clojure is about. And it's an important preamble to understanding spec because, uh, because we use data everywhere. Anything you do that can enhance working with data enhances all of this stuff. And, and that's something to keep in mind because I'm just gonna show you a tiny little slice of spec, but everywhere you see it working, you can imagine it working in these contexts. Over a wire, after you get something back from a wire, when you want to create a config file, when you need to parse a DSL, when you want to have something that writes code in your DSL, uh, it does all of that. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So the last point is the only thing I want to say out loud. So spec leverages the fact that closure is data oriented and it extends that power. And I think also in a sense, and maybe we'll revisit this at the end of the talk, I think that spec validates this approach to programming because spec is a small library that has an amazing amount of utility because of the you, you know, uniform and, and universal use of data throughout closure and closure programming. Uh, but this is closure winning. And this is the value proposition of closure, like sort of exposed. That you can have a thing like spec and, and have it work in so many places. So there are a bunch of ideas behind spec um, that I want to talk about. 
And I won't be able to talk about all of them. Some of them have duels. This is sort of this is sort of fake. <laughs> this yin yang thing. Uh, the predicative generative one though isn't, because there's a certain sense in which spec is bidirectional. So spec is a predicative specification system. It means, and we'll talk about this more in a second. But it means that you you say you know uh, this thing succeeds or is valid because this predicate, right? Just like any predicate, you can think of like map question mark or int or odd or whatever. Um, uh, it says true of it. Uh, so in one direction, right, specification is about validation. It's about saying, I have some stuff. Does it match this specification? Are these predicates true? But the cool thing about spec is in all cases, it requires that that go the other way. If I have this predicate, make me stuff. Go make me stuff. And that bidirectionality is, is really sort of the source of all the power in spec. Um, otherwise, it would just be a validation library. So we want to talk about that. Um, it's both a structural validator and a functional validator. So when we talk about functions, on, on one level, we can say, well, you know, it takes a this and returns a that. Um, that's useful, but it's not actually terribly interesting. Um, more interesting is saying what it does. So how do you talk about what a function does? So we'll dig into that. Um, the other thing that sort of the spec design sort of noticed was that there's not a difference, well, that when you validate something, um, you're, you're only half done. It's like, is this big hairy data structure somebody sent me you know, valid? Yes. Okay, well, I still have a problem now, which is what? Now I have to write a bunch of code that co-aligns in a significant degree with that validator in order to like parse it or walk through it. And, and I have conditionals in my code that, that branch in all the places where I branched in my specification. I wish I didn't have to do that. And it ends up that specification should yield destructuring, in my opinion, and spec does. Um, the other two big things that motivate spec and sort of underline the design is this idea of openness and change. Spec sort of requires specifications to be open. There are very few places in spec, or well, maybe none, where you can say you can't do something. And, and this is because there's one way to look at spec, which is that it's kind of a logic library. It's kind of a very simple logic library. And in, in logics, we generally don't say this can't be true of something because we don't know everything. So you rarely see that operation in, in logic that like this is the only thing that could ever be known about this. You don't do that in logic systems. And the reason why you don't is because you can't change anything that was ever written that way. The, it's concrete, right? If you ever said something like that, you'd be pouring concrete and you could never make a, an extension to that system because any extension would invalidate the first thing you said, which you said this is the only thing that could ever be possibly said. And now I want to say one more thing. They both can't ever be true. Um, so openness is the path to change. There are many other things about spec that are oriented towards change. For instance, when we want to be able to change things, we'd like to understand the compatibility relationships between what we had and what we're changing it to. There are some changes that are compatible. There are other changes that are not compatible. But how do you know that? Now, right now, what do we have? We have semantic versioning. How many people believe in semantic versioning? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a belief system, right? It's not, it's not science. Let's just say that. Right, it's not mathematics or anything, uh, because because you really there's no raw materials for for um, assessing that. It's like I changed it to 2.0. You know, well, what happened? Well, I don't know, but you know something dangerous did, and you better retest everything. Oh, it's only I only changed it from dot one to dot two. Oh, I'm fine. How many people believe that? <laughs> no, no. So um, so as we talk about it, you know, uh, we've chosen constructs in spec. Um, for which there are mathematical uh, tools that would allow us to say, you know, this set is either a subset or not of this other set. And that's a compatibility test, or this regular expression accepts the things that this other one did, except more, remains compatible. If it can't accept everything the other one did, it's incompatible. And, the, you know, that's a solved problem in mathematics. Um, the other thing that uh, SPEC does is it uh, makes sure that when you make a choice, you get a realization of that in data. Uh, and again, I'm not going to talk too much more about this, but it goes back to the point I made earlier about a validator 
that deals with or or, or optionality um, is making is branching. And later, when you want to manipulate that data, you want to know which branches it took. And unless there's a reification of that, you're not going to have that power. So we'll dig into some of these. So what does it mean for respect to be predicative? It means that we're going to specify what data and functions you know, mean by stating what must be true of them. And we're going to do that with just regular predicates. Ordinary predicates in code, like map or posint is now in closure and things like that, or composites of those things. Right, so it's, it's a positive int and it's greater than this number or something like that. Um, there are built into spec some combinators like end and or. And this is something we already have in closure. We have end and or. And this goes back to that um, choice and, uh, and branching uh, thing I just talked about, which is if there's an or, it could be this or that, and they're both specs. So either this spec is true or that spec is true. And you go down, and the first spec isn't true, and the second spec um, uh, fails for, for another reason. Um, or you say end, and the first one is true, and the second one is true, and the third one isn't. Um, coming back and just saying it didn't work. How many people like it when your users say it didn't work? Right, and you want some details. And of course, if, if we use the end and or of closure directly, um, we would only have that sort of thumbs up kind of characteristic. Yeah? yeah um, no, negation has got that closedness characteristic, so, no. Yeah. I mean, you can obviously make a predicate that's not, you know. Uh, evens are not odd, you know, sort of, in a sense. Um, so, the, so these, uh, the ones built into spec are there so that you can get uh, the branches remembered and you'll get detailed errors that are inside the branch. So we'll say, you know, this end, it's the third one that it didn't satisfy. And then, and so on and so forth. It'll navigate down into specs to be able to do that. <clears throat> so we use spec, right? We say require closure spec, we're gonna say S and that will be used throughout this. Um, there weren't too many people who didn't know closure at all, so I hope everybody else just sort of hangs on. Um, and closure code is written in curly, in, uh, in parens, and the first thing is the verb. That's sort of the main way to look at it. Uh, things that begin with colon or two colons are just symbolic identifiers that signify themselves. And yeah, everything's variadic pretty much everywhere you look. So we get spec, we say define big even to be spec end. So the ending of int question mark, even question mark, and it's greater than a thousand. We take three predicates and we end them together. We say all these things must be true. If they're true, it satisfies the specification big even. And then spec has a function called valid question mark that you can use to test something. You say is valid, you say the spec, and then you say the stuff. And it says no, or it says yes. And as I said before, that's, that's cool, but as we'll see when we get into conform, um, that's not enough, especially when you start saying no, you'd really like to understand more about it, or if there was branching in the, in the validation, you might want to recover that. And so there's another uh, primitive called conform that does that. It also does the validity test. So we make specs out of predicates. We can compose them together. We can end and or them. They can be arbitrarily deep, and I'll talk about some of the data structure ones in a second that allow you to make tree-like things. Um, but then given a spec, which is the predicate, all specs go the other way. So all of the, all of the baseline um, predicates built into closure now have corresponding generators for them. And then all of the spec constructs like spec end and spec or can compose those generators to make generators of the composed thing. And this is what allows spec to sort of go both ways to both validate stuff and against the spec or to take a spec and make stuff. Um, so, uh, so this is fun, one of the fundamental principles of spec is that you should be able to generate data. It's from this that we get the testing leverage that spec provides. Uh, so you should be able, spec should be able to generate data and functions that satisfy specs and spec can do that. Um, 
And I, I mentioned the, the testing is a primary use for this, and we'll look at that later. The other thing is just sample data generation. Right? I make a spec. This is going to be my wire protocol. It's really nice to be able to push a button and get an instance of data that corresponds to your spec and look at it and say, oh, no, I left out whatever, as opposed to writing it by hand and then just calling validate and having it say, no, 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 until you get it right. Uh, you just say, no, make, make me a right thing and let me look at it. Um, in general, this is for free. So you'll always get a generator for free. Sometimes, though, uh, the generator has to work too hard. Like, it can generate it, but it might take your entire lifetime to do so because the space of possibilities is so large. And basically, it's doing random generation until it generates something that satisfies a predicate. So sometimes you have to help it out and make a more specific thing depending on the density of the space. So it's pretty straightforward to say, you know, generate all the numbers and throw away the ones that aren't even. That's relatively efficient. Um, it's a much more difficult to generate, you know, very specific numbers like, I don't know, astronomical constants. A spec for that would try hard for a long time. So what does generation look like? So we have big even from before. Exercise is the simplest generator access that we have. Um, and it takes a spec and it makes instances of the spec. Um, in this case, it's exercising a piece of data spec, so there's nothing interesting, no interesting difference between these tuples of things it gives back. But when we have function specs, we'll see um, this returns a pair of you know, what I started with and what, it, what the conform value is. So this is a pair of values. It's the value it generated and the conform value when it's passed through the spec. For a primitive atomic spec like this, those two things are not different. Yeah. That's built into uh, int. <laughs> oh. Here. <laughs> You're generating all sorts of int types. No, no, no. Int, int already is int. Int has got a generator for it. Okay. So that's what I was saying. A, a bunch of the primitive that's sort generator. of bottom atomic okay. uh, predicates have generators built into them that already narrow the domains. That's correct. That's right. Exactly. Right. Uh, so this is generating uh, two things, right? A generated value and then the conformed version. We haven't really talked about conforming. And for something like big even, they're not different. So you get a bunch of big even numbers just by asking for it. I guess this is demonstrating another sort of important part of spec, which is uh, you know, when would you do this? What is this for exercise? It's for, for why you're programming, why you're writing your program. This is helping you. And, and uh, that's something you really want to keep track of with spec. And I think with Lisps in general, I think people, when they come to Lisp, they do not appreciate being able to use Lisp while you're programming just to make things more straightforward, to generate data or to look at something or to do whatever. It's not just like, you go in the REPL and you call the thing that you just wrote, right? You have all of the power of the language available to you to help you make decisions, assess correctness, and things like that in a very interactive way. So, I mean, as soon as you start using, oh, well, I forgot to ask, how many people have tried to use spec? All right, that number is still low. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's alpha, so, you know, I only want people to use it who are, you know, aware of what that implies. But um, once you start using spec, uh, exercise is like your favorite thing in the whole world. You write a spec, it's the first thing you do. It's just like, make it make some stuff. Um, and you'll immediately find bugs in your logic, like right away from this. We're not even running specs testing capability. So you can generate data. Can you just find generators for your own Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, it's completely extensible. You can define generators for your own predicates. Right, right. And you can also define generators for composite specifications. So if you really, and you can do this a la carte, like you can make one that's connected to your spec forever and ever, but also in a particular context, you can override the generator and say, right now, I don't want to make crazy looking data. I want to make data that looks nice for you know a screen or a presentation I want to do and narrow the domains. That's right. So rely on with the predicate or the spec, yeah. right? So you can connect it to either, either of those things. That's right. 
so we just saw something atomic. What, how, do, how do we talk about data structures, right? Because you know, atomic data is you know it's at the bottom, but it's not that interesting. It doesn't feel like information yet. You know, forty-two. It's like all right, I'm glad I know that. You know, it's not you're not there yet. Uh, so structural. So we have a bunch of we have a bunch of things that that will specify uh, structural predicates, um, and these predicates are built into spec. Every call of, which is collection of something or map of something. Um, and the, the target here, everything is this, or everything is a collection of those, or a map of whatever, that thing is either a predicate or a spec itself. Right? So you're not saying you know, some built-in type, you're saying a predicate. Um, so you could have a collection of big evens, which wasn't a type, it was just some predicate that you could satisfy. But you could say everything in this collection is big even. Um, so um, the other thing we do in Clojure, because we love our collections and uh, we have this big library, is we use collections for sort of two very distinct things, especially maps, right? We use maps as collections, like container-like collections. I have a whole bunch of people's addresses keyed by, you know, I have a whole bunch of people's um, friend lists keyed by their email address. So it's a map of email address to friend list. And the whole thing is email address to friend list. That to me is a map, an associative data structure that's being used as a container, right? A homogeneous container. But we take that same data structure enclosure, which you could put a million, you know, email addresses to whatever in. We also use it in a really tiny way, right? Where we say somebody's name is this, and their email address is that, and their phone number is this, and the whatever is that, right? And that seems kind of like recordy or objecty. It's still a map, it's the same data structure, it's the same everything, and all the functions work on either, but the pattern of use is completely different, right? Here we have heterogeneous maps, right? Where the maps keys could have different types, but they at least have keywords with different values, um, mapping to various values. So the name is this, and the age is a number, and the other thing is the other thing. It's not a homogeneous collection or container anymore. Uh, so we use maps as data records. Uh, and we use a different spec uh, primitive for that. It's called keys. And keys says, these are the keys that are in this map, that you can find in this map. And there are various ways it can say that. We'll look at that in a second. Um, the other fundamental sort of structural thing are sequences, right? So we already have Kalab. And in Kalab, you can say more things about the call. Like you can say the kind of collection is a vector. So if, again, if you're dealing with homogeneous data, you want to use Kala, right? But a major thing that we do, and you'll see I prefix the sequencing with syntactic, right? Is the other thing we do, especially in programs and DSLs and code, right? Is we have places where order matters. What did I say about closure code? The first thing is the verb. That's syntax. That's me saying, describing syntax. The order matters. Uh, and so how do you talk about that? Because that's not homogeneous anything, and, and order matters. And it ends up that regular expressions are, you know, the math of order matters. Um, and another thing to remember from before is that closure code is structural. So again, all this stuff is going to apply to code. All right, so let's look at something more involved. We're going to have, yeah. So this means that um, the program uh, it is, except it also has uh, recursion. So then it's context-free at that point. Right, regular expressions would support all regular grammars, that's right. And then the recursive aspect takes you to the text, yeah. You don't need to know that to use spec if you're not into that kind of stuff. Uh, so here we're defining um, a bunch of specs. <laughs> So you would wonder, why would you say A is int and B is int and X is string and Y is float and Z is int? I mean, why wouldn't you just use int later? And when we're going to see like sort of the first thing that seems really weird about spec. Right? So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to define, I'm trying to spec M. Right? This, that one. And when I spec a map, I'm going to use that keys primitive I talked about before. And what keys says is exactly that. The thing you can spec about heterogeneous maps is what keys can it have? In fact, you can say two things about it. 
what keys must it have, and also what keys might it have. This is not an exclusive list, again, due to the openness principle I talked about before. So if we work backwards from M, we're going to say uh, M is something that must have the keys X, Y, and Z, and it can, also, it can optionally have the key A. This spec for M's, for this kind of map, does not talk about what X, Y, Z, or A mean. Because, and that's what you would, how many people have used schema or something like it for closure, right? And I'm not picking on schema because I actually don't know of it. I don't know of anything that works this way, um, except RDF, quite interestingly, right? The RDF people were really onto stuff. They just like XML too much, but they really were onto stuff. One of the things they were onto was uh, decoupling the specification of the meaning of an attribute from anything that was a composition of that attribute with other stuff. Yeah. Okay, so the, the question is why why we have another database and not using bars as the database? Because like putting everything in one database is becomes tiresome after a while. It's overloaded. There's too much stuff there. Um, the beautiful thing about fully namespace names is anybody can have a database anywhere that they want. And so spec has a database where it wants of its stuff. Well, so it, it could have been, it, these could have been bars, right? We, that, that is a kind of database. I think that's a database that's overloaded. It's also reified, and if I was going to do anything with the bar system, I would reduce the amount of reification it had, in which case I really don't want to put more stuff in there. So those are two answers. I probably have 10 more. Uh, but but it, so, it's, so, uh, um, so everybody may not know. So the double colon means... These are fully namespace qualified. It, in this case, it's saying the, the, full name, the full name of this is the namespace that we're in, say user, slash A, user slash B, user slash X. As soon as you start using fully namespaced keywords in Clojure or fully namespaced bar names, as long as you haven't chosen like a really common word for your namespace, like ring, uh, if you follow the Java rules, Right, and either use com dot something you own or a trademark that you own or something like that. Um, that is a that's a universal name that's human readable. There's a tremendous amount of power in that. Closure supports namespace names. I think we're underutilizing them because one of the really cool things you can do with namespace names is you can have a database anywhere about anything. It does not need to be everything about this has been poured into this bar. Everything you could possibly say about this. The documentation string here is there. You know, people always say, oh, we should have examples on VARs. We should do no, I mean the VAR has a fully qualified name. Make a web service. Examples of whatever. Take the VAR as a, a parameter and return whatever you want. This should be a, a path to many databases, not the the VAR system is the dumping ground for all knowledge. Um, so back to keys. So is that good? Is that enough? You need more? <laughs> Maybe later. <laughs> Let's squash that. Uh, but it's an important point because I sort of skipped over it. So uh, spec has a database of keywords mapping to specs. And it's built in, and the way you talk to it is with spec def, saying, I'm going to define the spec for this fully qualified name. You cannot define the spec for something that's not fully qualified. Um, so we're back down to the map. We're saying this map has these keys. We're saying the keys X, Y, and Z are required, and the key A is optional. But we're not saying what's in them. And this ends up being super important in order to make systems that can compose data. Because, and, and so therefore, where are the definitions for what X means and Y means and Z? They're the things that happen first. They all have their own definitions. But it means that if it's some other part of my system, I want to make a data structure that has you know, user Y and user Z and user A is required. I don't make another thing and I don't re-say what X and Y and A mean again, because that's a bug, right? That's just a bug waiting to happen and redundant. 
and it can't be done dynamically. We'll talk a little bit more about the dynamic case later. So um, basically, map specs in spec are sets of keys. Um, well, they're multiple sets because some are required and some are optional. And again, it's not closed. So that's what that means, that keys thing. It says M is a map and must have X, Y, and Z. Their meanings are defined somewhere else. And it, and it may have A and other stuff. Um, and we'll talk about why you would even have optional that can also have other stuff it doesn't talk about uh, in a second. Yeah. It's a little Allow other keys, right? Except there's no, there's no false option in spec. There's no disallow other keys, and that would be the closed problem I had before. You will, you will think that you want that. There'll be a time in your life where you think you will want that. Then there'll be a time if you ever make that for yourself, which you could do, but I'm not going to do for you, where you will regret doing that. True, and be correct. Yeah, it's it's just gonna happen, right? Uh, so uh, so I'm not gonna help you do that, um, and it, you know it's happened already. And we've had like we've had consulting clients who are like, oh, we want to have this, and we we do it, and then this happens. And what what so what happens? What happens is it's the concrete boots, right? You have an inextensible system, and you cannot fix it except by going back to the original spec and saying, you know what, I shouldn't disallow this. You really do want to make open systems. You really do want to make systems where if it's not the keys you care about, okay. You just don't read them, right? You don't care. Let it flow. If you let it flow, you can make a system where somebody can add something at the other end and everybody in the middle does not care. That's super important. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, except, except it's still sort of contextual and the beauty beautiful thing about this is you can go back to those, I mean, it doesn't really define what the keys mean. Right. These yeah. independent key definitions mean you can compose arbitrary sets and unions and intersections of key sets. And you don't need to redundantly state what the keys mean. Um, yes? How do you catch typos? So it depends on like what where you want to catch it. Like your spec is broken or your use is broken. So if the use is broken, you if you're calling validate and it's a required key, it'll say you know you pass zz instead of z. You know you didn't pass z. You can do that. Yes, it doesn't help you with that. If you really, if somebody really needed it, then they would have to ask for it. But it doesn't help you with that problem at all. Yeah, right. That's the other side of an open system because A, B, you know, it could be useful to somebody else. You know, this person specified this. Um, didn't do that. If it was important for you to produce data that had A and you wanted to validate that, you could take data that you intended to meet this specification and specify it more stringently with your own spec where A was required and catch that problem. Like if it was, it was part of your, it was part of your contract that every time I call this other person who's asked for an M, I want to supply an A, you could make my M spec where A was required and you could validate your data before you sent it. Um, but otherwise it's an, op it's an open system. I, you know. Yes. Yep. <laughs> of course. And that's why it's there for generators and for testing. So the generators will generate it and test will see this data. Because th what you're saying is the thing that interoperates with M's will use A if you supply it. So you want to supply it sometimes to ch test that part of the code. All right, so let's start using it, and we'll dig into a little bit more on some of these details as we go. So the first thing we can do is just we can call that valid function from before, right? Is this a valid M? And we pass a map that has an X and a Y, and it says no, all right? And again, yes and no is not that great, right? So, so something went wrong. Um, so we have 
another new operator we haven't seen yet, which is called explain, which takes the same spec and a value, and it will tell you what about it doesn't satisfy the spec. And it says quite verbosely, and in, it can also, you can get a data version of this, which you can process programmatically and make it colored or print whatever strings you want. Uh, but it's telling us all the information, right? Which is this value that you pass fails the M predicate that it must contain user Y as a key. I mean, user Z as a key. It doesn't have that. And it doesn't have that in the first thing that you pass. Uh, oh, it also says the user, the X value that you pass fails uh, the fact that X is supposed to be a string and that Y that you pass to was supposed to be a float. Um, so all these things are wrong. So explain this sort of nice, it finds sort of all the problems. Um, and it tells you about them. There's explain data and other things like that. We're not going to dig into those. So we fix our problem. We try another thing. We make X a string. We make Y a float and include it. And we include Z. And now it's valid. <coughs> We can try another version of it where there's uh, X and Y and Z and B, and it says it's not valid. What's interesting about this? Who has a really good memory from one slide ago? <laughs> B wasn't listed. Wait, we didn't talk about B in the spec for M. What is happening? What is happening is when a map is checked against the spec, any spec. Right? It's an open system. All of these predicates for the map spec itself are tested. Right? Must have X and Y and Z. It may have A. That's not something you actually validate. But all keys in a map will be looked up in the spec database to see if there's a spec for them. And any value that's supplied under that key will be validated against that spec. So here, there's a spec for B. We did define one. We didn't use it here. But there is a spec for user B. It says user B must be an int. And here we're passing user B as a string. And when we ask for an explanation, it says user B is not, a, not an int. Why could this possibly be valuable? Why would we do something like this? This has to do with composability and flow and flexible systems. Right? How many people have ever built a system where there's a front side of the system and it's getting data over the wire? It has to do some initial processing and it looks at some of the keys of the map that comes in. Then it hands it off to somebody else and somebody else and somebody else and blah, 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 blah. And somebody way over here at the end of some processing chain looks for some other key and tries to use those keys and process that data. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, you do that all the time. That's how you make a flexible system. Otherwise, every time you touch anything, you touch everything in between. So if you don't have something like this, when are you going to find out that B was not an int? All the way at the end, it came in here, went through all these things, and blah, blah, blah. And then somebody tried to use B and was like, whoa, that's not an int. That's a string. That's wrong. Right? So how do you know what went wrong, where it was wrong? Well, you spend a few hours looking at all the code in between these two things, right? which you don't want to do. Uh, so the other beautiful thing about the system is that um, it allows these tests to run anywhere a map spec is run, which means this will be checked all the way up front. We will find out about this problem at the door. Somebody supplied a B for consumption way down in the chain, and it isn't correct, and therefore it gets flagged. This is a big deal for composability. So, requires a field? Yeah, let's say, for example, you use the key in column C. They include the your stuff done for implementation. How does that? Yeah, so again, if you, if you want to make sure that everyone, so we, what we found here was an instance where um, they may not need B, but when they look at B, they're finding the wrong stuff. So this is sort of two different problems, right? This says, this says B is not the right type, doesn't satisfy its spec. The thing you're talking about is I need B. I need B, you need to flow all the way up. You need to include that in your door if, if you need B, right? You're either going to, well, you'll discover it whenever you say I need it. 
But if you want to make sure you reject it at the door, you will need to include that in your at the door spec. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to summarize what he said because I didn't hear it. Um, <laughs> which is, which is, the nice way to do this is to build a system that allowed programmatic composition of dependent specs and not have like the master knower of all things write the big bad spec. Right. Uh, okay. So, so this is sort of one of the big benefits of the specs for the keys are independent of the specs for the composite. Um, as in addition to arbitrary composition, intersection, unions, and things like that. Uh, so let's try that exercise function again. We're going to use M now, and we get a bunch of uh, maps that correspond to the spec. And somebody was asking about A, and you see sometimes we have A and sometimes we don't. This A was optional. And this is just the beginning of exercise, but you know, if you run the generator, you'll get big, hairy combinations of everything um, with, with big and rich data. Um, so we can exercise the map spec. If you can't read this, uh, this is just lifting user up off the nested keys because they have a shared namespace prefix. So that's just new syntactic support for maps. Yeah, you could. You could absolutely have a predicate. So you would you would start with something like the structural predicate. It's a collection of whatever, and then end that with some assessment of the distribution. Right with end. Right, that's the point of composition, because otherwise all these specs would have like so many knobs on them. Right, so they don't. Uh, all right, everybody good? Yeah. Which version of the language supports that? Uh, one nine will will have this, yeah, yeah. If you get if you get one nine to you spec this, this will just start happening to you. You can turn it off in the REPL. I think it's on in the REPL and off over wires by default uh, right now. Okay, so we see exercise at work. Um, so I already talked about a lot of these points. So I'm not going to dig into them, right? So we have arbitrary composition, right? A B C B C D A D E. We do all that. We can subset things. We can have intersections. We don't need to make named uh, things that restate the key information in order to get these. In addition, we can dynamically make unions of things that satisfy two specs, and we don't need to ever have made the union of these two specs spec necessarily. As long as you know the, the consumers can satisfy their specs, we're fine because they're open. Somebody's going to give a talk about that at the conch. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, he's apparently turned spec into a type system. Spec is not a type system. Uh, I didn't ask. Are there any like Haskell or Idris people or whatever? Haskell, okay. Feel free to. Yeah, that's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna bash on versions more later. Uh, right. So it, it is great, right? Obviously, any tool that can help you like check is really good. The thing I would like to see at the end of the day with spec is that if you have broken the spec from before, you do not use that name again. Call it dash two, whatever. How many people know com? Ever did com programming back in the dark ages, right? One of the things Com got right was you don't change stuff like that, right? There was two and three, right? And ex they called you know, my my thing ex. It's like better today. And my thing ex two, right? People that did that. How often did you get to three? Or exx? 
x or dx2, not very often, right? It's pretty rare that you break things that way. But if you really do break things, stop using the same name. That's just update in place programming. It really is. And having the user have to have this out of band information about versions and all the crap around versions that pollute how dependencies work, it's a catastrophe. Right? And this goes, this is not just about code, right? How many people do this stuff? How many people have version web services? You do. I mean, come on, you can raise your hands. It's like this is a standard thing right now. Right? It could be better, right? It would be better a lot of times if the entry points just were called two. What's better about it? Well, your old clients could still call one, you know, because it's not gone. And you could support them both transparently. You wouldn't have to have this event. Oh, we're starting API 2 next Tuesday. Make sure you move all your clients to API 2. Because it's out of band. As, you know, so versions are really problematic. But you need something, right, to be able to make decisions about, did I, can I re use the same name or not? Uh, you know, Liquid Haskell is trying to do, you know, as much of this as it can ahead of time. And it's, yeah, sure. Yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of cool work being done with uh, these uh, SAT solvers and whatnot to provide sort of this kind of same, it's the same, right? It's sort of the same space, right? This sort of generative thing to go figure out. Uh, uh, but yeah, they're trying to do more of this early. Um, and there's a subset of this that it can do. Um, obviously, uh, parameterized types can do things this can't do. Um, but this can do arbitrary things, which it'll take a long time for SAT solvers to figure out. I mean, there's like there's sort of like a world of things SAT solvers can do, and then a world of things they are going to take a long time before they can do. Um, uh, but, but I really haven't talked about the context of use much here, because I really would not like this to be um, uh, uh, mapped in people's minds as a correspondency to a type system. A type system does certain things really well, has almost no application outside of some context. This has a wide contextual application, and it does what it does. Um, so let's just talk a little bit more about those keys. So we saw an arbitrary composition, right? Subsets, intersections, the reuse versus restatement. This is a high reuse system then. You reuse the same keyword keys. But it also means if you have a fully qualified key, you're going to nail down the semantics of that key and you're not going to change them, right? Uh, you get this flow. I talked about that before, right? We check B as early as we saw B against B spec. Um, and in general, this yields self-describing data, right? Fully namespace qualified data is self-describing. I think the sum of these things is, you know, is a path towards flexibility. I guess I didn't talk about it here. How many people use fully qualified keys all the time? Well, yeah, not too many, right? It's great, um, but I don't think this is common practice. What's more common practice? Not doing that. Right? So what happens? Are you stuck? And it ends up, no, you're not stuck. I'll go back to, yeah, here. There's a require dash un and op dash un, which says I require these keys unqualified. Right? But what it takes is the same qualified names. And what you're saying there is when M sees unqualified X, it means user X. And go look up user X's spec and use it. So it's a connection, because you can't define what X means with no qualifier, because we'll just race to like define what X means and you know, yell at each other. So what you're saying is, for this map spec, X means user X. Unqualified X means user X. Um, yes, you can say the spec for B is the spec for A. Is A spec, yes. Yes, pretty much anywhere you see a predicate here, you can put a spec. You talked about the union and the spec. What is, what is that uh, there's a function called merge. Uh, I may I may not be in this talk. So there's a function called merge, which is a, which is actually to go and take two map specs and say, yeah, both. That's up to you. 
Yes. Yes. No, you don't. You wouldn't. Yeah, so I, I, I hate the context dependence of JSON. I mean, I think, you know, Eden says... That was a big mistake, right? It's just awful. And namespace keywords and the way Eden works uh, and the way extensibility works in Eden is completely about that being evil. Um, because JSON can only use what JavaScript had, they end up with this context dependence. So that, that nesting is strictly like context qualifying. Um, and there's lots of context qualifying. People use prefix strings and all kinds of stuff for it. But if it has the letters D-A-T-E in it in a row, you know, use this parser. Uh, so there's just a lot of ick there. Um, the sort of, so there's sort of two problems. One is I don't think you would be doing that in Clojure and Eden in the first place. Um, but if you have to deal with it, you know, the mapping to spec allows you to deal with it. You can say, look, I'm accepting these things. Up at the top, you say the DB spec says these unqualified keys mean these other things and you sort of connect it all back to a namespace qualified world using the context to make the mapping but you end up with something that can do everything i talked about so far except catch that b error but everything else you could do so the support for unqualified keys in spec is actually quite good really you, you do not lose any of the power except the ability to detect that b is wrong early because if it's all context dependent you have to wait for the context uh, validator to run, the context-specific validator to run. So can you have an abstraction, like an algorithm, like could be an int or float? Yeah, you could say int or float. Uh, there is a number predicate already that's, <laughs> inter, that's int or float. But sure, you could or those two things together. And you would, if you generated it, you'd get some ints and some floats. Yeah, int or string. Yeah. Like, what? Int or string. Int or string. Yeah, well, I mean, number. Well, I mean, you could do that too. You could do, yeah, you can use OR, and OR is arbitrarily, you know, has all the power of disjunction. Um, like, let's say you have, like, user, like, red user flip, and they need to have a friend list. And yes. How do you, like, like, how does, like, how does specification detect and make sure that, like, oh, they are working for each other? And if you try to, like, you know, realize one way to handle it without bringing it over the there, there's no references, so I mean, uh, this is value. This, you know, this is like functional programming with values. So there's no reference stuff. Um, but uh, whereas the structural predicates themselves are not going to do what you want, and the thing you want to check, double check later, you can do right. Just use and say it has a structural thing, and let me make sure all friends are mutual. And that's a predicate you can write that would run against the structure. Um, but you can't uh, accept using end. There's no support for that check inside this. You use composition to get that. Uh, but you can. You can check the arbitrary stuff, sure. You can go and double check, for instance, that, right? Mutual friendship. If that was something you had, you have a predicate called mutual friends, question mark, and you'd say end, you know, it's a you know mapping of username to friend list, and then and mutual friends. And get it that way. So, right, so you can use real code. I mean, obviously, that you know, that's the nice thing about this, right? You can write code, you write code, and do arbitrary stuff. It's very, you know, that's it's that's why we use Lisp, right? Yeah. Eventually, we just want the power. You know, you can make the fanciest system you want. It's only going to include the things it includes. And tomorrow, when I want something else, I don't want to have to do research and extend the compiler. I want to just write code. Uh, okay. So, now let's talk about syntax. So we talked about maps, and we have you know, uh, homogeneous collections. We have column and things like that. And that's what you use. If you want to say I want a vector of integers, you're not going to use this, right? This is for syntax, right? 
What does syntax mean? Everything, the Greeks and the, the Romans, they like, they figured out what everything meant. And they put it in words, and we like, you know, pillaged all the roots. But if you go back, you, you end up with, you know, a lot of resources to use. And so the word syntax actually means an arranging in order, where the, the order is where the meaning comes from. Uh, and Yes. Well, so they don't they don't actually use syntax for their for their languages right, much, right, right, right. but they know what it is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but we use it in programming a lot in code, and hopefully almost not at all in information. Right. This is a big difference. If you're going to put a, make a wire spec, I hope you're not don't need to use this. The first thing I'll send you will be that, and then the third thing will be this or that. I mean, no one wants to be on the other end of that, <laughs> right? So, so we use syntax. We use it in our functions when we have multipolarity languages like Clojure, right? We use it in our functions for positional calling because positional calling is really convenient, and the scope is small, and the documentation is right there. So it's not like being on the other end of the wire where, like, the third thing must be X. Um, but, you know, I've already shown you a ton of code that was positional, right? Def. The first thing is the name. The second thing is the spec or predicate. That, that's syntax right there. It's a verb, thing, predicate. The order matters. Um, so when we, when we are dealing with syntax, so when would that be? When we're dealing with languages like Clojure itself or DSLs. We're making our own languages. We want, might want that same convenience of syntax for our users, where we want to provide order matters. Then what do we do? And it ends up, again, there's this beautiful thing. So we use set logic for maps, right? Sets of keys are what maps are in spec. And for, um, for order, regex is the map of order. Um, it can describe all regular grammars, right? Um, that involve ordered things. So the, the trick is, you know, Regex is, to most people means strings. And the, the jumping point for that is now just imagine that instead of being strings and saying it's this character or that character or one of these characters, you can say predicates. Right? That's the first leap you have to make. And the other is um, that they nest. <laughs> so they can be uh, sub expressions, which also are predicative. Um, and, and when you do that, then you can say, oh, I understand the idea of regex is when applied to predicates. Um, usually, abstract. But is there a reason why you can write regular expressions instead of Yes, because regular expressions have nice syntax. No, because, because spec is a language itself. So one of the, one of the problems with grammars is you always have two things, right? The, the grammar, it, can, it doesn't work in line. It doesn't work like code. So in an expression, it's actually, regexes are much more lispy. They really are much more lispy. With grammars, it's like, here's your grammar, and now combine it. And uh, regexes can be in line. And so um, it comes with a lot of what? Yeah, but that's a, that's an implementation detail. Okay. So, what are the operations? Right, concatenation. Right, this, then that, then that, then that. Right, alternation. And here we're talking. It's not or. We're talking about regular expression alternation. This pattern could appear. That pattern could appear. And those patterns dictate what else could appear because they're going to turn into expansions. Um, so they sort of. It's like or that splices in place. Um, uh, repetitions, right? Zero or more, one or more is not even primitive, and zero or one, you know, those are not primitive. Really, regex is just the first three of these. Um, so you have those two, and then there's a special one called end, which um, extends this system of regexes to say, it's this regex plus these predicates, which are not regex. Um, but we want them to be true anyway. Be 
No, it's to specify specifications for syntaxes. Let's look at one. So what we're going to say here is we, we expect this string of numbers. I'm not showing you a syntax for code, but I expect a string of numbers. And we'll start just from the middle here. Right? This says, my syntax is you must start with 42. Right? And then you can have uh, one or more odd numbers. And then I want to see uh, a map that can have uh, A, B, and C, must have A, B, and C, unqualified in it. And then, so we can look back up above for the, the syntax of the, I mean, the specs of the keywords, right? And then I want some odds and evens. And here I'm gonna say, um, I wanna see an odd and an even in a row, and as many of them as you wanna supply, um, to a max of three. Right, so I'm composed, so that's the use of the end. Right, I say odd even, odd even, odd even, but if on the count of those, that set reaches uh, three, then we're done with that. And then the rest, I'm just going to say, as long as it alternates between, it's either an odd or an even, you know, and not alternates, I'm sorry. It can be an odd or an even, and we'll just take all the rest there. So the first thing we're going to do is just try to um, try that here. So we're going to, like, let's just look at the numbers and see if it works. So we got a 42, then we had 11. Right, so we're good, and 13 and 15, that's a bunch of odds. We're still good on that next thing. Then a map comes up, so we must be done with the odds. Right, we're going to say, what's the, what's the spec for that map? It needs A, B, and C. Okay, we can already see what our problem is going to be, but this explain will tell us, and, and we're done. So we go and we run explain and it says no. Right, at the fourth value, or the, at the fourth index, right, the fifth value, you gave us this map. It was supposed to match the M syntax from the, uh, from here, and it doesn't. It's missing B and it's missing C. So this is a regular expression parse of this. So I've talked a bunch about um, the difference between validation and destructuring, and so now now we're in a place where wow, like imagine imagine if you had to consume these syntaxes in your code, right? And you ran the validator instead of it saying no, it said yes, it's valid. What is your code for processing this data structure going to look like? The same, and it's going to have all this trickiness to it, right? Because it's going to need to say how many odds did I get, and is it not an odd anymore, and you're going to rewrite the regex logic in your parser. That's really unfortunate. So this is the same, uh, just the same as before. You don't have to try to read it again. Uh, and now we're going to have a valid one, right? So 42, three odds, a valid map, right? Odd, even, odd, even, and odd, even, odd. So we have one, uh, we have one, two, three uh, pairings, and then we switch. Oh, so we only do two because we want less than three, fewer than three. So it's valid. We say it's valid. So if this is the front door of our system, we'd be done. It's valid. Then we have to process it, though. We have no help. So now we're looking at sort of the, the power feature on validation in spec, which is conform. Conform doesn't give you a simple yes or no. For every predicate, and in particular, for the composite predicates, N or the map predicates and all the regex predicates, there's a definition of what that spec does when conforming data. And it's not going to give you the same data back. It will give you labeled, or what we call conformed data back. So let's look at the conformed value of the spec. So the first thing that's interesting is the spec for syntax was specifying what, fundamentally, with cat. What's it saying the top level data structure should be that, it, that satisfies the spec? A sequence. And what does it return? What does conform return? Not a sequence. Conform always returns, conform of cat always returns a map. Right? And the, and the other thing we'll notice about this regex in the first place, I didn't even talk about when we were here because we didn't know why, but one of the things you might have wondered was, why are there all those names? Why isn't this regex just 42 odd 
question mark plus, you know, M, M then OE star, whatever star. Why did you make me label these things? And the reason is because I'm going to give you back those labels when I conform this. And if I, if I didn't match a pattern, the, the key wouldn't be in the map. Okay, so only the things we found are there, and everything that we found is labeled. So, the, no, there's no generation yet. Right, so this is this is just instead of just saying yes or no in validation, we're going to conform the data. So let's look again. Let's look back. I look. I went back a screen, but the, the spec is right up here. Let's look at the spec. So the overall cat has every um, every element in the sequence labeled. Right. Plus has no labels. Keys, well, keys is a set of labels in the first place, right? Maps are self-labeling, right? Cat again, nested, has labels, right? Star doesn't have any labels, but alt has labels. Way back at the beginning of this now long talk, I talked about choice and paths, right? I'm not going to dig too much into it, but that's, that's choice and paths in action. Everywhere in spec there is a choice, there must be a label, and when you get conformed data back, the, the paths will include the labels. And then you know which branches were taken, and your data is now sitting essentially destructured for you in a way that makes, I mean, who would, who would prefer to consume this map versus that sequence? Me, for sure. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's not doing any work that Valid wasn't doing. Right. It's just, it's it's just capturing it. Yeah. Well, I call it conform. Okay. Because one of the problems that's is that some... The actual values, right? Basically, the 42, the rolling, Well, the it's, more, it's more just like a label. It's, it's say, this value can conform to the 42 rolling. Well, it, it's not exactly because... Because like the keys things like A, B, C, they really are specs like rules. These other things are just labels. They're just, we make you label the inside of cat. We make you label all the choice points in spec. And the reason why we do is when we, when we conform it, we give you the conform value back labeled, organized by the labels. No, no, it's just keys. It's whatever ordering you get. It's a map. It's closure map. So no order. No, we'll give you the first valid confirmation. Yes. No, we don't do that. It ends. It ends up that if you have a syntax for human beings to do that's like that, that's not going to be a happy syntax. It makes a lot more sense for strings than it does for this. I mean, I understand the idea, but we re I rejected it for this. I have a question. Yes. No, return to distinguished, not invalid. Um, a, a distinguished invalid value. And there's a there's a checker for that value. Right. So it's a distinguished value. So obviously, right. So the question is, what does it return when it doesn't conform? It can't return nil, for instance, because that might be the conform value of a certain spec. So it returns it returns spec invalid. Okay. Keyword, yeah, a special. Dis, I'm sorry if I'm being distinguished value, so that you you can look at it and say, well, I know that's that can't possibly be the conform value. It's 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 invalid. It, it, I didn't hear. It's a way to look at it, right? So the question was, is it an abstract syntax tree for it? Um, you can consider it that way. Uh, certainly, I'm going to make the case that the beauty of using spec for deciding the user input for your DSL was valid is you get this parser for free, right? Um, whether or not you consider this an abstract syntax tree, it depends. I mean, it's not enriched with any other information. But it certainly is a tree um, with all the branches labeled. So it's that much of an abstract syntax tree. If you needed to restore the order of values, you would get that from the spec. Because the map is also. If only there was a function called unform. 
which there is. <laughs> which takes this conform value in the spec and it will return this back. Which is so super cool yeah, yeah. and so much fun. Yeah. And then you get five yes, you do. As long as you're still conformant with the spec with your transformation, you can do transformations in between. You could call, you can, co right, you can call, right, unform with the different spec and you can conform that value, right, to go yeah, yeah, back, right? Yeah. And you can also do transformation. So, for instance, let's say you had optional data. This is advanced spec now, but it, let's say, so there is unform and it, it will take the conform value and the spec and put it back into the original, an, an original form. Um, but let's say you had a spec and there was optional data and your downstream consumers didn't consider it optional. You could take user data, conform it, it's conformant, but they've left the options out. You could supply the options in this form, then unform it and get back data that the next person wants to see with all the defaults filled in. That's one application of that stuff. Uh, the last stuff like the answer can you think of, of network protocols with a certain definition of headers yeah, yeah, yeah. In a certain order. Yes. It would be a good thing to, to, to write something that would like, yes. Part, you know, like yes. analyze a big string. Yes. So I spent all that time early on sort of saying, look where we use data in all these places. Because, so that's the wire, right? You were talking about a DSL, a language. Right. Yes, 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 yes. All application domains for spec. Exactly. So there's, there's something really cool about this, which is that um, you talked about order Yes. Um, and what you've done by introducing all those names. Yes. Is that you've gotten rid of the order. Yes. Yes. Right. Because, yeah, because otherwise you're not really destructuring. Yeah. Otherwise you're still going to have this job. So a lot of the conditionality of, about processing this, or at least at least duplicating the work yeah. of parsing this, is not necessary in your, in your handling code. So conform. When do we call this? Whenever you want. While you're developing, you can call it. If you've written a DSL, you can call it and use this as your parser. Like the first 10 seconds, David Nolan had this library. He took his entire parser for Ohm Next and threw it away. He specced his protocol and got a free parser with way better error messages than he had before. Um, I recommend doing that. So all of this exercise stuff, it works. It doesn't matter how thick and gooey your specs get. We can still generate stuff, right? We can still exercise that spec and we get exemplars. So what if you made wire protocol specs and you need to test your wire? Hmm. Do you want to write stuff that like generates data for your thing or do you want to like take the spec you wrote that says, is the wire okay? Turn it around and say, make stuff and send it over the wire. That's what I want to do, right? If you want to look at the language you said you were going to write and you wrote the spec for the DSL, you could push this exercise button and get programs in your DSL written for you. They would be gobbledygook, but they'd have the right shape. Um, which can really help you because you say, oh, look, that's ambiguous, or I don't think people are going to want to write that, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, can you exercise the specification based on the so that would be about um, the generators used. Um, right now, we do not have generator overrides in exercise, but it's on the punch list. So there's a lot of places where we do allow generator overrides. Very in particular, we allow them in the testing framework. Um, and uh, if you call generate yourself by hand, and exercise is just a wrapper for calling generate. If you call generate yourself, you can supply overrides. When you supply overrides, you can make Things that generate only nice data, you know, only subsets of data, you know, only you know, only so far, various kinds of limits. Um, so if you want to generate data that doesn't look horrible, right? Because the, these generators, by default, they're oriented towards testing, so they're going to try to push. So if you said, yeah, order numbers just to make sure I'm going to call an order number so that I'll have the ability to force this later and exercise order numbers in a different way. Yeah, so you can use the path system, which I'm not really talking about tonight. 
to talk about a sub part of a spec and provide a generator override just for that part. Right? There's a lot more stuff, let's just say. You talked about you know, generators that have run for yes. a couple amount of time. Yes. Is there any kind of estimation or governor that says, yeah. well, this is going to take three years, do you want to do it? No, no, no. It basically will try a certain number of times and say, I can't, I can't satisfy this spec in this, and I'm, I'm giving up. It just punts. Um, it doesn't run forever. Uh, it will it will stop and say no, I can't do it. And that's when you say, oh, I probably need a custom. I need to help the generator out a little bit. Uh, and that often doesn't mean doing the whole job. It can it can often mean just narrowing the the space somewhat and letting the rest of the auto stuff kick in because whatever you generate is still subject to validation. So you can make a partial generator, and it gets you close, like it means 80% of the values that this partial generator generates are valid. Valid gets called on it and invalid values get thrown away. So it's not like you have to write a perfect generator, but you could like at least narrow the domain so that it can succeed. And then the normal predicate based filtering will happen, which is what's built in, um, which is quite nice. You could just take care of the hard part, right? You're never going to make a correct looking you know, I don't know, URL. Although there's cool libraries that have generators for regexes. What control you know. do that? This is just a number, there's a knob. Okay. You can set it. Okay. No dumb questions. So, so the question is, can you use it to make a constraint satisfaction to yourself? I mean, I would say it's not really, whereas I said it's sort of like a logic engine, it obviously has generative capabilities. Um, well, yes, you could. I, I, you know, you could. Would I, would, is that like a recommended way to do it? Probably not. Um, but some fun stuff has been done. Like Christoph Graham took, uh, um, I guess, uh, some, some example program that, that played set. You know, the game set where you like match three things in a row. And he took like, you know, it's, it's something that's been implemented in a bunch of languages and they compare the implementations. And so it was a closure one, which is sort of just your ordinary sort of functional, but, but somewhat, you know, imperative, make a thing, generate the things, call, you know, whatever. And he turned it into spec, like a spec program. It was just like a bunch of specs and a call to generate <laughs> and, and validate. And it played set and it did everything. Oh, it shuffled the cards, it dealt, dealt out hands and, you know, found the, found the sets. Uh, so you could treat this like CoreLogic or a mini counter or something like that, except it doesn't, and it has cool properties, right? One of the properties is it uses random generation for ex exploration as opposed to, you know, the like typical prolog tree exploration. Um, uh, but there's more. Why is that cool property? Why is that random? I think it gets you through the space faster. Yeah. The, it, invariably, in something like mini counter or whatever, they eventually get to constraint domains, and eventually they add a randomizer. Yeah, <laughs> they always do. Yeah. Like it always comes. Yeah. And it gives you a better view of competition. Yeah. So you get around faster. Let's just say that's the simplest way to say it. All right. Let me keep going because it's already taking too long. Um, so I talked earlier about being structural and functional. So far, I've only talked about structural stuff. So one of the things that I think it would be too easy to do is look at spec and say. This is a poor man's dynamic type system. You know, you show me int, checks for int, checks for stuff that I could definitely do with type systems, um, and especially with you know some of these uh, more advanced systems, you, you can do a lot. Uh, one of the things I think is a lot trickier is to talk about this part, which is if you just say the type of this, you know, it takes this and it returns that, right? That doesn't really say what the function does. And what I mean does is does from like the person who's paying you to write this program does, right? And it doesn't tell you if that function is correct, again, from the perspective of the person who's paying you to write this program, right? Who's not going to buy into mathematical correctness as, you know, satisfying the types. It's a, you know, it's a solid program, right? In the end, the people who pay you, they care about the difference between less than and greater than. And, you know, only a few type systems do. Uh, so what does the function do? Well, there's a bunch of stuff that would matter in terms of making better statements about the arguments, 
right? Because a lot of times there are preconditions on the relationships between the arguments. But that what a function does fundamentally is a predicate over the relationship between the arguments and the return value. It crosses values. So this value crossing is an important thing, and spec supports both of these things. So imagine we were trying to write a function called range ran, and it takes a start number and an end number, and it's supposed to generate things greater than or equal to the start and less than the end. And we just write ordinary code. This is the other thing about spec. That's ordinary code. Maybe the person who wrote it didn't spec it. Who could write the spec for it? Anybody else, right? These things are not connected. It doesn't get compiled into the var space when the code gets compiled. Um, you will very much be encountering unspec code from other people. You can write the specs for that code, either to validate stuff or just to you know validate your understanding of what it's supposed to do. Um, so we have the function. Um, this does what it's supposed to do. Then we want to we want to spec the the, the behavior of the function. And it ends up there are three aspects to the behavior of a function that you might want to spec. You might want to spec the argument list. You might want to spec the return value. And then this new thing I just talked about, which is what does a function do? The actual function of the function, right? The transformation, right? So the arg spec is a spec of the argument list. And there'll, there'll almost always be a kind of a regex spec because our argument list and closure are positional and they're you know variadic. So it ends up regexes are good ways to spec the argument list, which are syntactic. Right? So we're saying it has an, an, an int and an int. We'll call the first one start and the second one end. And now isn't it nice we have those labels? Because what's the next thing we want to do? We want to make sure that the start is less than the end. And so we can add that additional predicate on, uh, on the values. So now we're respecting the values, but also the relationship. The return value is just an int. And then we say range rand is working when it returns uh, a value that's greater than the start and less than the end. And that's what this says. So what actually gets passed to the fun spec are the conformed arguments and the conformed return value. Which means you get labeled conformed stuff and you can write predicates on those conformed values. And that's what this last thing is. Right? The conformed value of the arguments will have something called start and end and the conformed value of the return will have something called ret. And you can use those names, those keys, to talk about the conformed values and then make predicates over those. This is you know, a lot of power for talking about whether or not functions are correct from a stakeholder perspective. Um, now, some things are harder than others, right? I mean, the, the testing of this, uh, John Hughes has been in this space for a long time with quick check and things like that. You know, there's a lot of relationships between this and property specs for property-based testing. Um, and some things have straightforward properties. Other times you're like, well, my property seems to be a re-implementation of my implementation. And that's true, but sometimes you can make a model Right. None of those problems go away. You have a path at least to talk about this if you want. That's optional. Are there any questions on this? Yeah. Well, it sounds a lot like uh, contract programming. And what's the difference between what or which you add with those? Methods? I mean, I, I, there's lots of flavors of contract-based programming. Um, so you'd have to talk about a particular flavor. Um, but yeah, this is this is a, this is like that. Absolutely. The first thing actually told me the state library, look, you've changed up the use for you know, same library that you use for for data. Yes. Right. Yes. But it's not just types, so that's the thing. This fun one is not just types. Yeah. So range ran is just a regular function, right? And we haven't touched it. Right. When you say fdef, you're saying I'm making a spec for the function named range ran. That's what fdef does. And, and it's spec that all oh, the No, 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 no. I mean, you, it's actually restating it here. You're specking all the. I could, you, I could have called it Fred and Ethel. It doesn't. It doesn't look at this. It doesn't look at the function definition. 
Okay. Yeah, these labels could be anything I want. It could be X and Y or something. Right? So, no, it doesn't look at the source code for the function because you could write the spec first, then write the function and see if you did it right. I mean, that, that will become what you do. Uh, okay, I want to keep moving because it's going slowly. Um, when you do this and you want to get the docs for range ran, if there's a spec, the docs will be enhanced. This function will also return the spec in addition to the doc string. And now we can exercise functions. So we're saying exercise this function. Uh, when you exercise fun, the pair of things you're going to see is a generated argument list and the conformed return value. So when I call range ran with negative one and zero, I got negative one and blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can exercise your functions. Again, as soon as you have this and you use it, you'll use it all the time. You write your function, the first thing you'll do is do this. Because what do you do otherwise? You type these things in the REPL and you look at it yourself manually. So calling exercise fun is just way faster and will exercise more of your stuff. So this thing here has nothing to do with spec on the last page. Yeah, it uses oh. both. Oh. Yes, yeah, so it uses the, both the function. It's calling this function and it's using the spec. And it's using the spec for two purposes. It's using the spec to generate arguments to call the function with. And it's using the spec to validate that the to conform the values that are returned. Okay. So it's using the whole, it's using everything, you, everything on this page it's using. Because right, it, it's calling ranged ran. Um, so this is, this is a generated argument list. It looked at the arg spec and said one number, another number, but you notice the first number is always less than the second number because it used that spec. I'm confused because I don't see uh, the spec being passed Right, so, so that's good. That's a good question. So look at the f def. It's not a keyword. It's an ordinary symbol. When you say f def, you're going to pass a fully qualified symbol name, or it will use the namespace that it's in, and it's going to it's going to imply a relationship between that name and the function, which has the same namespace qualified name because all functions are in namespaces. So. We're, when we use the back tick there, we're, that's saying user ranged ran. And that's going to find the function called that and the spec called that. Use the spec to generate arguments, call the function, use the spec to conform the return values and, valid, you know, and conform it and return what came out. If your function doesn't work, it will tell you. And then well, you can. One aspect that I want to ask uh, if I'm correct is that it follows the, the idea of having an open function. So in other words, no so yeah I mean it's not going to say what will happen when the data is bad but there's a bunch of things about calling a function and a function running that can be tested and we're going to talk about that in a second all right so we're trying to approach robustness from the perspective of stakeholders, right? That's what you should be working for with a robust program. It's not about satisfying yourself. It's not about satisfying a compiler. It's about satisfying your business requirements. So as much as you can capture in specs, it's a good deal. The key here is that it's not a type system. It's not for use at the same point. It actually can't do the job of a type system, which you know flows information about the types and statically is able to do some checks against the validity of a program versus the types uh, that are defined. Instead, this is, a, this is a set of tools for doing robustness checking. So how do we do that? What we don't do is we don't turn on all this stuff at one time and ship a program with all of this overhead. That's not what spec is about. Spec is about making sure your program works before you ship it, right? And trying to force out any problems with your program. So how are we going to do that? The way we're going to do that is with ahead of time generative testing, right? Not runtime checking. Spec is not runtime type checking, right? So what are the tools we have for that? The main tool we have is something called check, right? And it's a namespace called test. And yes, it's very much based around uh, quick check, right? And it uses Clojure's test check, which was a port of quick check. Um, so the purpose of check is to say, if I give this function correct arguments, 
does it do what its function spec says? Right? Self correct. We can test that with generative testing. We can generate a whole bunch of argument lists, call the function, validate the return spec and the function spec, if it's present, and make sure everything's okay. So that's check. The other thing we have is called instrument. An instrument says, did you call this function correctly? Did you, did you call it with arguments that satisfy its spec? And that's something that a type checker would check via flow analysis, right? We're gonna test by turning on instrument during testing or during interactive development, not at runtime. Right, so check calls a function generatively hundreds and thousands of times and makes sure it does what it's supposed to. Instrument says, if anybody calls this function, check what they pass, make sure it satisfies the ARG spec for the function. And finally, we have something called the cert, which allows you to sort of make um, dev time assertions about things that will not be present in production. So that's what this looks like. We say require spec test this test and then we're calling, you know, we're using the piping operator. We're saying pass range ran to test check and then summarize the results. Test check is a, can test whole namespaces and everything that's been spec'd and various other sets of things. So this is a summary of running one function through it. Um, but this will, this will call it a thousand times with a bunch of different arguments. Um, and if it, if it doesn't pass, it does all of the quick check style uh, shrinking. So you get the smallest possible argument list that causes your function to fail. And a nice, pretty version of that. It ends up that range ran worked, and this just says it's fine. Um, but that's a lot of tests you didn't have to write. And the tests are way better and way weirder than the ones you would think to write. Um, and weird generated tests do a better job of testing your stuff than, the, you know, I tried it with 42 and it returned 7 or something. Um, then the other thing we can do is we can instrument ranged rand. Again, this is not something you do in production. But you might do while you're running the test suite of a different namespace, or just leave instrument on during REPL-based development. You can say instrument this namespace, instrument everything that's spec. Right? So you just turn that on and keep programming. Now as you program, if you ever call a function the wrong way, it will tell you that. And so now we're saying, I called range ran wrong. I did. Nothing wrong with range ran, but this, this thing I typed in my REPL did it wrong. And if, if instrument is on, it will give me the failure report. And there's something called unstrument, which turns that off. Yeah, so we're going to do that in pieces. Uh, we're starting with the macros, because that was the thing people wanted better error reporting around. Uh, but yeah, there will be specs for a lot of the language functions. What? No, 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 you have to, you have to say instrument. Right, we do, we'd never be on by default because I'm going to have a slide here where I'm going to say, don't do this in production. There you go. Uh, don't do this in production. I'm going to make t-shirts. Don't call check an instrument or assert or turn on or assert in production. No, no, no. I mean, so, so you have, I mean, you have a lot of power. You have regex, you have nested specs, you can use sets. You can say this could be, you know, 42 or 47. All sets are, are predicates. So you can use just sets. You know, I, I expect Fred, Ethel, or Lucy. You can do that and um, you can even deal with variatics without or because you can, you, know, you can put alt in this thing. So you can deal with multipolarities and um, I mean, you'll, you'll find it highly co-aligned. That's not to say it will do everything. Um, a lot of times when there are sort of subdomain relationships between arguments, you're going to need to help it out. Um, but you have all of, uh, all of test check, uh, you know, there, and that has, you know, combinators like bind, uh, that allow you to build like a model and then have the model flow through the subsequent generators. So that means like when you want to make dependent data. Somebody talked earlier about, I want mutual friend lists, but a lot of times you have dependent data, like there's a set of things here and then below, everything should be one of those things. So that you can do with this, what would bind. You can create a, generate a model and have other generators dependent on the generation of that. 
and that will um, allow you to make correlated relationships so that they're connected and also it will shrink which is super cool uh, so yeah all that stuff is is in there all right so don't use this stuff in production right the recipe here is check is for running running tests before you ship it's generative testing it's actually you know pretty expensive to run um, but it's quite comprehensive and automatic and mechanical um, instrument is something you can have on while you're developing. It's something you can turn on during testing, including during testing that uses check, right? I'm testing this thing and it will call other things and it will make sure we're calling them correctly. We just instrument everything. And then you turn it off and you ship your program. But there's plenty of things you can do at runtime. Like your program might parse data that comes in over the wire. There's no problem. You can validate inputs from human beings. You can have a DSL and you expect to use your, do your DSL. You can call conform on stuff that comes over wires. Um, you could generate data at runtime if it was useful to do that. Um, but the testing part and the validation part um, of your program is, is to be done in advance. Right? If you do this at runtime, then all the other languages will laugh at us. So don't do it. It's not what it's for. The reason why all this generation stuff is in there is because it's the path to doing robustness in advance. If there wasn't a generator, you'd only have validators. You'd put them everywhere, you'd have them turned on all the time. right? But you, you don't have to do that across the generation. So <laughs> although we talked about a lot and for a long time, there's a way more stuff. right? Unform we talked about a little bit. Custom generation we talked about a little bit. There's a keys star which does keyword arc style stuff, the same as the maps. There's nil ability. You can override uh, generators during instrument. You can do replacements. You can do stubbing. This is really cool stuff. Like how many people are ever are frustrated when you're trying to specify uh, an API that calls over a wire and you got to like mock things out or whatever. It's really difficult. So it's really easy to take the spec for what you're supposed to send and the spec for what you're supposed to get and build a little U-turner thingy out of spec that doesn't use the wire at all and you know, validates both things and gives you back stuff that you expect. Um, it's like quite straightforward just by using uh, instrument plus check with overrides in place. That that sort of just slice off the wire and put a, a validate generate U-turn in there. Um, on form we talked about and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so um, this is just sort of a flavor. I started with all that stuff about data. Right, so there's the reason why closure exists, and the reason why it is the way it is, is because you can write things like spec, which is a smallish thing. It really is small, but like, look where we can use it everywhere. It's just like the library, and it's just like what people find in their own programs. Right, the generality here has huge benefits. The, yes, a spec is you know something you have to invest in to write. But the amount of leverage you get for that investment is all huge, right? You get to exercise your functions. You get conformers. You get parsers. You get generation. It works over wires. It works with data from other people. It's not, I mean, it's just much different. The other thing is we looked at all these functions a la carte. They are a la carte. You should think about, I can use spec to do that right now to just help me with something at the REPL. Um, or I can build a really cool testing framework that combines instrument and test and check and, and whatnot. Um, so it's a set of tools you can put together. It's not just a data structure validator. It's not a pretend type system. It's not a wire protocol checker um, uh, necessarily. So uh, the one thing I would encourage you is just to sort of think out of the box. A lot of times, once you have spec in hand, the easiest way to do something is just to write a spec. You look at some data like that one, two, three, five, a map, and blah, blah, blah. You're like, oh, I got to write a parser. No, you don't have to write a parser. If this weird data, the first thing you do is, oh, I'll just write a spec for that. I get a parser for free. I get conformed for nothing. Right? I have some functions somebody wrote, and the docs are terrible. I think it does this. Well, spec it, and then run check on it. It does. Or no, it doesn't do that. That fails. Maybe it's broken. Maybe I don't want to use this library. It doesn't work. Um, 
you can get data, you can mock up a system, you can pretend you have wires and other people to talk to when you don't. You can just try out the thing that you just wrote. So the point of spec is you apply some effort to specify things, you get a ton of leverage. Validation, parsing, data generation, communication, destructuring, testing, etc., 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 etc. And I think it validates the closure model of programming against data because you see this kind of leverage, this kind of reuse. And I think as closure programmers, you see this all the time. Um, but this is, I, I think, makes it sort of clear why you use a dynamic language like closure. So thank you.